guess we're starting. Uh, welcome everyone to the virtual tour today that Owen has prepared for us. I note that we are joined here virtually on Treaty One territory, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe Cree, Oji Cree, and Dene peoples, and we are also here on the homeland of the Métis Nation. You're welcome to type in the comments any shout outs to whose original lands you are inhabiting today, if you'd like to. Dr. T Dr. Taves' virtual talk today will further delve into the history, the recent histories of settler, settler colonial dispossession that continue to mark and structure Winnipeg. It is my complete delight and honor to introduce to you my colleague, friend, and comrade Owen Taves. I met Owen a few years ago, and I've gotten to know him through our mutual interests in abolition work. Owen is a core part of Bar None, which has been at the forefront of a rapidly growing interest in penal abolition in our city. Owen's work as a scholar, writer, and organizer shows how abolition, that is, the creation of safer, safer more just, anti-colonial worlds, is an attainable, existing, and necessary vision and goal. His generosity, intellectual and otherwise, also attests to the fact that abolition is a practice of the everyday, life in rehearsal, as Ruth Gilmore reminds us. I learned a lot from you, Owen, and from Bar None, and I thank you for that. Thanks so much, Serenity. Owen uh, Tess is the author of Stolen City, Racial Capitalism and the Making of Winnipeg, published by ARP Books in 2018. He received his PhD in geography from the City University of New York in 2015. His work examines regional geographies of racial capitalism and the local alliances, development plans, and modes of consciousness mobilized to mediate processes of economic restructuring and to achieve regional dominance. He lives in the West End of Winnipeg and is a member of the abolitionist prisoner solidarity group Bar None, woohoo, a member of the anti-austerity coalition Budget for All, and he is an adjunct instructor in urban and inner city studies at the University of Winnipeg. Born and raised in Winnipeg, he is descended from Russian Mennonites recruited by Canada in 1874 to occupy Southern Manitoba. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Owen Tays. Thanks so much, Serenity. Um, uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, this is gonna be a virtual version of a walking tour that I do usually do in person. Um, <clears throat> so uh, ho hopefully it works out. Um, <clears throat> Today's tour will look at how urban redevelopment decisions, predominantly those made by the city's Urban Redevelopment Authority Center Venture, have reshaped Winnipeg City Center in the first two decades of this century. We'll see how the local racial capitalist state via Center Venture reiterates the dispossession and displacement of poor and working class communities in the city, in particular urban indigenous communities. Um, and just following what, what Serenity said earlier, um, by, you know, by indigenous, I, I primarily mean <clears throat> um, Cree, Anishinaabe, OG Cree, Dakota, and Métis um, people in Winnipeg. Um, uh, and we'll see how these decisions deepen the city's housing crisis. <clears throat> um, the places we'll see today are the result of a dominant gentrification agenda designed to make Winnipeg city center more profitable to large real estate interests um, after half a century of suburbanization. Uh, by evicting indigenous peoples and low-income people from the area in hopes of luring a whiter, more affluent demographic to a city center remade for conspicuous consumption. Um, <clears throat> the loss of affordable housing in Winnipeg has been felt even more deeply since the COVID-19 pandemic began, as crowded temporary shelters have become even less safe. On October 6, 2021, uh, city housing official estimated that approximately 1,000 unhoused people are currently living in approximately 115 unsanctioned self-built encampments across Winnipeg. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to share my screen now and get this slideshow going. Um, and I also, I also wanted to say off the bat, um, please, uh, ask questions as we go, feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, I don't think I'm gonna be able to see like um, raised hands or comments in the chat. So please just, um, I'll try to leave, uh, I'll try to like pause and ask for questions. Um, but if you do have a question, please feel free to, to interrupt me um, <clears throat> just by saying something. Um, 
So, um, and I'm also going to try to try to leave 20 minutes at the end for uh, a wider discussion. <clears throat> okay. Um, so here we have a map of Winnipeg for people who aren't familiar. <clears throat> um, the, the city center is sort of bounded by the Assiniboine River on the south um, and the Red River on the east. Um, <clears throat> uh, these are the sort of these are the historic um, rail yards in the city, the Canadian Pacific Railway rail yards that divide the north end from the rest of the city. The north end is the um, historically uh, working class uh, neighborhood with a long history of radical politics. Um, <clears throat> was the hub of the 1919 Winnipeg General Strike, perhaps most famously. Um, we are going to start our tour. <clears throat> I'm, I'm assuming you can see my. Uh, the cursor here, like when I circle things. So hopefully, if you can't, maybe just tell me. Um, so we're gonna start here where Main, so this is Main Street, Portage Avenue is, is down here that runs east-west and Main Street runs northwest. Those are the two major um, thoroughfares of, in the city. We're gonna start our tour at the corner of uh, Main Street and Higgins, um, at essentially the corner of Main Street and the rail yards. <clears throat> right here. Um, and just for a little, sorry, I keep going back and forth. Just for a little uh, uh, overview, we'll start on the Main Street Strip here. We're gonna move to uh, the Waterfront Drive District here. Then we'll move to the Sports, Hospitality and Entertainment District <clears throat> on, uh, along Portage Avenue. Um, and then if we have time, uh, we'll, we'll um, go to the Central Park neighborhood for a minute. Um, <clears throat> okay, so here, so the, this is the Youth for Christ Center for Youth Excellence. Um, <clears throat> this was the first project um, that Center, Center Venture sponsored that um, got me, <laughs> piqued my interest in Center Venture and what exactly they were up to when I was a, a graduate student. Um, <clears throat> so Youth for Christ is an organization that um, openly aims to Christianize children um, and so when they sought, they sought public funding in 2010 to build um, this sort of this pretty massive um, youth recreation complex uh, in the North End on, on Main Street, um, it immediately <clears throat> uh, generated resistance from the community because this is an Indigenous neighborhood. Um, and as Indigenous activists soon found out, Youth for Christ um, sp specifically was was targeting at the time indigenous children for Christianization. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Youth for Christ went uh, to the city looking for land and money for this. Um, they were redirected to Center Venture and Center Venture directed them to this parcel of land at the corner of Higgins and Maine. Um, <clears throat> so briefly, Cent Center Venture was created to basically dispose of a bunch of uh, vacant land and buildings in Winnipeg City Center. Um, that had come to the city via tax foreclosures over decades of, of abandonment via suburban, the suburbanization of the city. Um, so Centre Venture said, sure, you know, we can give you land, but it has to be this exact um, piece of land right here. Um, so it was really Centre Venture's idea to build this um, Christianizing complex here. Um, and then they brought the, the development to the city um, <clears throat> asking for $3 million, which they eventually got despite fierce community resistance. Um, so this was described as, quote, a contemporary, th sorry, this the Youth for Christ Center for, for Excellence was described as in the community resistance to the, to the proposal to spend public money, was described as, quote, a contemporary altered form of the residential school experience, uh, end quote, by Nahani Fontaine, who at the time was a representative for the Southern Chiefs organization. Um, and the, par the parallels with, you know, Indian residential schools in Canada are, are clear just in terms of um, this, you know, state sponsored Christianization of Indigenous children. Um, <clears throat> so Youth for Christ did uh, get that $3 million and, and free land from the city to build it. Um, it, op it opened in 2011. Um, <clears throat> and it was also particularly um, offensive to the to the indigenous community in the area because it's right across the street. Um, you know, if we were standing here, we could at the same time uh, see this building, and also we could see um, Th Thunderbird House. I'll go. I'll get back to that slide. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, Thunderbird House. This is uh, 
you know, uh, spiritual um, and cultural hub of the city's indigenous community. Um, and this is the one part of a very extensive plan for the Main Street Strip um, that the indigenous community in the city created in, in the 1970s. Um, <clears throat> so the fact that it's right across the street was, was particularly offensive to the community. Um, I'll just go back to this slide. So this is Center Ventures um, uh, territory, essentially. So Center Venture was created by, by the city in 1999. Um, it was given jurisdiction over this area. Um, and so all city owned, in one fell swoop, all city owned land, um, vacant uh, land and buildings were transferred to Center Venture in 1999 within this area. Um, so they were tasked with basically um, giving away land, uh, often with um, grants and you know various forms of free money to uh, the wealthiest developers they could find. Um, <clears throat> and so um, we're here on the Main Street Strip, Winnipeg's Main Street Strip, um, and this is you know a well a well known um, indigenous part of the city. Winnipeg's indigenous uh, population started to increase quite significantly in the in the decades after World War II, um, and in terms of the the local racial order and the um, <clears throat> specific apartheid geography of the city, um, Indigenous people were forced north of Main Street and often into um, sort of uh, you know cheap hotels um, and restaurants and cafes um, along along the Main Street Strip. Um, <clears throat> and then in the 1970s, um, the city's indigenous community uh, got to, got a plan together called the, um, the Neganin Plan for Main Street. Um, and basically it was a plan for an indigenous run uh, urban village along the Main Street Strip um, <clears throat> that, would, uh, that would include um, housing for families, elders, single people, students, people traveling to Winnipeg for short term stays. Um, which, you know, people from uh, especially northern uh, and rural indigenous communities often have to travel to Winnipeg for healthcare and other appointments. Um, <clears throat> and it was also to include um, community clinics, childcare, meeting space, youth recreation, indigenous owned businesses, including worker co-ops. Um, <clears throat> uh, but they, but this, uh, and Negan, the meaning of Neganin is um, in Cree, uh, means our place. So it was a real claiming of this part of the city by indigenous peoples in the 1970s. Um, <clears throat> uh, funding for the for the the entire vision was not um, forthcoming from any level of the settler state, um, <clears throat> except during the 90s there was they, there was a little bit of funding that got um, Thunderbird House built, and then also, um, although this wasn't really funded at all by by the government. Um, a bunch of urban indigenous organizations got together and bought um, the old train station on Higgins, which we could also see from here. It's actually just beyond Thunderbird House um, in the background here. Um, and so that's now uh, the Neganin Center. Um, <clears throat> okay, so moving on along our tour, this is the Bell Hotel. Um, so this is one of the last hotels still standing um, from the heyday, the sort of 1960s heyday of the Main Street Strip. Um, uh, by the end of Center Ventures uh, interventions in the area. So, so <clears throat> when I talk about the heyday of the Main Street Strip, people, sort of elders in the community will, you know, talk, talk to me about um, this time on Main Street as you know, quite a special time. Um, of course, like, of course, the racial order of the city forced people, indigenous people onto Main Street um, but there was quite a diverse indigenous community here in the 1960s. Um, and it was quite different, you know, from the main street of today. Um, so people from, you know, many different indigenous nations living together in the same places, um, socializing in the same, <clears throat> in the same cafes and restaurants, um, and, and bars, uh, listening to music. There's a great documentary about the, about the main street strip, um, called Brown Town Muddy Waters. Um, about the about the music scene on Main Street, um, <clears throat> it was a it was a political hub, right? It was a, where a lot of political organizing took place. Um, <clears throat> but over the years, the city sort of systematically demolished um, a lot of the most of the hotels where people were living, um, and most of the the bars where people were gathering were in the hotels. Um, <clears throat> so 
Center Venture uh, in 1999 took ownership of a bunch of hotels, demol demolished most of them. This one was left standing. Um, <clears throat> um, and in 2007, um, Center Venture evicted um, the 75 people who were living in the Bell Hotel. Um, it sat empty for four years while Center Venture looked for a buyer who would gentrify it. <clears throat> Finally, Main Street Project, was a, which is a organization that runs homeless shelters in the city, um, bought it and turned it into a housing first facility. <clears throat> um, it's now a 42 unit apartment block, um, meaning that a total of 33 uh, affordable housing units were lost in Center Ventures um, <clears throat> redevelopment of the hotel. Um, and it's now a supervised um, sort of housing first facility. Um, it's like, so essentially, you know, the people I talked to who live, who live there, um, <clears throat> we're, we're grateful for, for the apartments there in terms, in terms of, um, <clears throat> the, the relative amount of freedom that, um, they were provided compared to the, the other shelters that, that Main Street Project runs. Um, and so, so Main Street also, it's, <laughs> it's tough doing this virtual tour because if we were standing here, you would be able to see, um, the biggest, you know, homeless shelter in the city across the street. Um, <clears throat> but essentially what the, what the city and center venture did over the decades was demolish places where indigenous people were living and gathering and replace those places with a very like sterile, sterile, authoritarian, <clears throat> um, heavily surveilled temporary shelter infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> so this is sort of somewhere in between a, a homeless shelter and actual apartments for people. Um, but we can we'll move on. Um, this is just uh, steps south down Main Street. <clears throat> um, this is the Winnipeg Regional, uh, Winnipeg Regional Health Authority building. Um, this land was formerly occupied by five buildings, including Jack's Place Hostel, which was an indigenous run 40 person shelter, Stoneblock Apartments, Starland Theater and Rex Theater. <clears throat> um, in 2008, Center Venture gifted this entire block of land and half a million dollars to a developer called Resolve Group, and they built this headquarters um, for the WRHA. Um, and while <clears throat> it, it would appear, it appeared on the surface that the arrival of uh, a health authority building on, on the Main Street Strip would be good for people in the neighborhood, it essentially is an office building like any other. Um, it doesn't really provide um, much in the way of services to people in the area, um, and we can sort of see that um a little bit by this sign on the door uh which says uh make sure the door is closed behind you thank you um <clears throat> it's not open to the public it's not a public facing um building um and the same can be said as we walk as we cross the street um <clears throat> and walk um to the united way this united way um building at 580 main street um, in this was this land was also owned by Center Venture. Um, in 2010, the United Way received seven million dollars in public funding um, and the land for free from Center Venture to build this headquarters. Um, and combined with the Regional Health Authority building, um, this building uh, replaced former residents of the Main Street Strip with 300 white collar office workers. Um, and both developments were accompanied by uh, sweeps by the Winnipeg police to move people out of there um, and make the, the office workers in, these, in this building uh, more comfortable to come to work. Um, <clears throat> so this building is also closed to the public. Um, and I should have said that uh, all the, I took all of these photos on one, uh, one day, which was uh, a month ago, September 17th, I believe, um, a sunnier day than today is. <clears throat> so um, we're going to leave the, the Main Street strip now. Turn left across Main Street. Um, this is one of the last one of the last um, <clears throat> hotels. This was never never abandoned, never owned by the city, uh, as far as I know. The McLaren Hotel, um, where people are sort of low income people are still living on Main Street. Um, and we'll pass this 1960s era urban renewal project. This is the Planetarium and Manitoba Museum. <clears throat> um, entire you know, swaths of, of Main Street were demolished uh, for this, um, as well as for uh, Winnipeg City Hall. <clears throat> um, so now 
we're going, we're leaving Main Street and we're going down into uh, Winnipeg's warehouse district, the exchange district um, on our way to Waterfront Drive. <clears throat> um, people drive Porsches here now. Uh, this is one of the um, <clears throat> more recent developments. Uh, this is a former um, pumping station. This is the James Avenue pumping station. Center Venture owned this for a long time before they found anyone to develop it. Um, I'm, I'm not, I don't know that much about this um, <clears throat> other than uh, they received an undisclosed, the develop, it's private developers um, built apartments here, offices here, and there's a restaurant in here. Um, and they received an undisclosed amount of uh, public money through tax increment financing. That's a, a program separate from Center Venture that, um, you know, gives private developers uh, a lot of money up front and, and then they pay it back. Um, you know the same amount that they would pay their property taxes normally um, except it goes back to re it goes to repaying that loan and they don't pay property taxes so essentially it's quite convoluted but essentially um it's a it's a grant usually of uh, several million dollars um <clears throat> so it's now home to a marketing firm that specializes in agribusiness um and they market uh you know, some version of the city's history here. I haven't been in here. This just opened during the pandemic. So uh, I'll be curious to, to know what version of the city's history that um, you can get when you go for dinner here. Um, this is what it looks like when we cross Waterfront Drive um, <clears throat> into Stephen Juba Park. Um, and we'll f when we do enter the park here, we're, we'll be standing in front of uh, this obelisk, this monument to the Winnipeg Aqueduct, um, which is the which brings Winnipeg's drinking water from Shoal Lake Forty First Nation um, <clears throat> in uh, northwestern Ontario. I don't know what. Well, it straddles the border of Ontario and Manitoba, um, <clears throat> which uh, was it has been hugely controversial over the especially over the past couple of decades as people from Shoal Lake 40 have brought to Winnipeggers attention that actually the construction of the water of the aqueduct um, severed uh, part of like turned part of their community into an island um, that required a ferry to cross. Um, so completely disconnected uh, people in that community. Um, and also uh, Shoal Lake 40 didn't have clean drinking water themselves until just a few weeks ago um, when their their water treatment facility was finally completed um, and there was quite a, quite a lot of organizing to force uh, the city of Winnipeg actually to to partially fund that anyway so this plaque doesn't talk about any of that um, it talks about the aqueduct as an engineering a feat of engineering um, and uh, we'll just move on into the into Stephen Juba Park <clears throat> um, so this trail runs sort of to your to our right. We'll, we'll see um, <clears throat> the condo co uh, condos that Center Venture built, and to the left is the river, um, the Red River. Um, and you know, often this is often uh, occupied by people living in encampments um, who are unhoused otherwise. Um, <clears throat> So here we come to the sort of center of Stephen Juba Park. Um, <clears throat> uh, this land was the site of a former rail spur. So this was all abandoned um, 20 years ago. Um, <clears throat> it was, it's been described as the spiritual center of the 1919 Winnipeg general strike. Um, so the park, Victoria Park that was here a um, hundred years ago um, was a hub of organizing and photographs from the strike show, you know, thousands of people gathered at, uh, at mass meetings um, during the strike. Um, <clears throat> uh, now it's luxury condos that Center Venture um, had built by private developers. <clears throat> um, in the early 2000s, Center Venture offered the land very cheap um, and offered special financing. So that's another function that Center Venture serves. Not only do they offer grants and land, they, they also offer like, uh, you know, loans financing that a, that a bank at rates that a bank would not. Um, <clears throat> and the stipulation was that only luxury condos would be built here. Um, sorry, I'm just, uh, okay. I'm looking at the chat now. Oh yeah. 
yeah, please, uh, sorry, I'm forgetting to pause for questions, but please do, um, please do interrupt me. Um, <clears throat> So another thing while we're here that I just wanted to point out was that um, this gap, so people in these condos can see right down to the river and that center venture did that. There used to be trees here, they cut the trees down. Um, and their idea was to open up the riverbank, um, you know, where <clears throat> in their, in their uh, words, untoward quote unquote, people were living. Um, they wanted to put eyes on the street um, you know, luxury condo eyes on encampment people, essentially, people living in encampments. Um, this was one of their strategies of sort of like safety by urban design um, to make the area less hospitable for unhoused people um, and more hospitable for condo owners. Um, <clears throat> so, and I, I apologize for all these st statistics, but um, I hope that they have some kind of, kind of an effect as they accumulate. Um, between 2005 and 2008, 200 luxury condos were built here, um, originally selling for between $200,000 and $700,000, and now um, some are, are valued at more than a million dollars. Um, and in Winnipeg, that is quite a high price. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I'd, we, we can quickly point out about Stephen Juba Park is that there are quite a few uh, monuments to the Selkirk settlers, <clears throat> which are the first white people to try to live year round in the area in the early 19th century. Um, so the fact that it's sort of a, this was one of the sort of the earliest gentrification frontiers of the 21st century. Um, and they say they sort of pay homage to uh, the original settlers of the area, I find quite fitting. Um, <clears throat> Maybe I'll, I'll try to pause right now as we, we're going to leave Waterfront Drive. Um, are there any questions? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on. Um, <clears throat> so we'll get back sort of, we'll walk through the warehouse district. This was, this is the Ashdown warehouse. This was the first sort of warehouse loft conversion in the neighborhood in the 1980s. Um, one thing about gentrification in Winnipeg is that it moves quite slowly um, as a sort of slow growth city, like city Winnipeg's population has grown quite slowly and steadily uh, since World War II. Um, it's uh, the firm, you know, it's big firms uh, don't show massive profits uh, they show steady small profits every year. Um, it's not really a boom and bust city. <clears throat> um, uh, so it does gentrify. It gentrifies a lot slower than, you know, so-called global cities like Toronto or Vancouver. <clears throat> um, so we're going to make our way to Portage in Maine, um, sort of the center, the symbolic center of the city. Um, <clears throat> here you can see on the this blue line, we're coming up from uh, waterfront Drive to Portage and Maine here. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, in the past, we've gone sort of through this underground shopping mall um, and we're gonna go over to, to Smith Street a little bit of a ways. Um, but I also just wanted to point out um, <clears throat> uh, that this uh, former Bank of Montreal building at the corner of Portage and Maine is now owned by the Manitoba Métis Federation. Um, the MMF purchased the building from the Bank of Montreal in 2020 with a portion of its $154 million settlement from the government of Canada <clears throat> for the theft uh, of 1.4 million acres of land um, the Métis people were promised in the 1870 Manitoba Act. Um, <clears throat> so this was, you know, one of the first sort of, their sort of, first sort of high profile um, purchases with that settlement, um, quite a symbolic purchase. Um, and this, and it will be uh, uh, Métis Nation Heritage Center is the plan, uh, apparently. Um, but they're flying the MMF flag <clears throat> at Portage and Maine. Um, this is what Portage and Maine looks like. Okay, so we're headed for Smith Street. <clears throat> um, so this. Uh, this is a former Manitoba housing tower. So most, if not all public housing in Winnipeg is owned by Manitoba housing. Um, this 21 story tower was built in 1973. It originally contained 373 units of public housing. Um, 
<clears throat> so that's you know state-owned uh, rent geared to income housing, the most affordable housing uh, available in the city. Um, so that's quite a quite a bit. Um, residents were evicted by Manitoba Housing in 2015 when pipes burst after decades of neglect by Manitoba Housing and by the provincial government. Um, those residents were never allowed to return. It was supposed to be a temporary uh, eviction uh, or relocation, and they just never brought anybody back. They never fixed the problem. Um, and instead, <clears throat> um, the Manitoba government sold this building to Edison Properties in 2018. Um, Edison Properties is a huge landlord in the city that owns over 5,000 apartments and 25 high-rise towers <clears throat> across the city. Um, they sold it for $16 million um, and it's now being converted into uh, Smith Street Lofts, uh, which I believe will be luxury rental units. Um, <clears throat> and there were, of course, some vague promises that some of the units will be affordable, uh, which I highly doubt. Um, the provincial government said at the time of the sale that um, private ownership and market rate rents would be better suited to the quote revitalization of the area. Um, <clears throat> and many former residents, uh, it was reported, ended up in temporary homeless shelters as a result of being evicted from this building. Um, so I, I mentioned that um, provincial government statement that this was contributing to the revitalization of the area. Um, because this has this is very much you know related to what Centre Venture is up to um, just up the block, which we'll get to. Um, <clears throat> so just across the street uh, is the this is a brand new Winnipeg Police Service headquarters um, that was completed um, in 2016. Um, <clears throat> I don't have much to say about this other than um, well, actually I do. Um, that uh, so this was a very controversial development project purely in most uh, the way it was reported because of the corruption involved. So the cost of the building uh, skyrocketed from by about seventy five million dollars, um, and the mayor and his friends, the former mayor of Winnipeg, Sam Cates, and his friends who he employed in uh, at City Hall were investigated by the RCMP for corruption having to do with it. Um, they were never charged and now the city of Winnipeg is actually suing them both. Um, <clears throat> um, but I also, but I did want to talk a little bit about the Winnipeg Police Service because they are quite implicated. Center Venture is always communicating um, with the police um, in terms of uh, trying to find hot spots where untoward quote unquote people um, you know, are congregating uh, so they can demolish those places and clear those people out. Um, <clears throat> so what's, what Center Venture is really involved in, you know, in the way that I uh, see it is redrawing the sort of lines of, of urban apartheid in the city, right? So <clears throat> at first, um, the, the apartheid order sort of dictated that Indigenous people stay north of Portage Avenue. <clears throat> that resulted in Indigenous Main Street, which was then a target of uh, demolition by the city. Um, people moved uh, south of Portage after that, after being pushed out of Main Street. Um, <clears throat> and, and now sort of places, the places where <clears throat> urban indigenous people are congregating south of Portage Avenue have become uh, targets for destruction by Centre Venture. Um, and the police collaborate extensively in that process. Um, <clears throat> It's also note noteworthy, of course, that um, the Winnipeg Police Service was the target of the, the largest um, mass march in, in the city in about 50 years um, <clears throat> in the summer of 2020. Um, of course, marches took place all over the world um, after the Minneapolis police murdered George Floyd. Um, <clears throat> but um, in Winnipeg, the context, the specific context for the march, um, the local context, I should say, was also that um, in April of 2020, so the month before um, police murdered George Floyd, um, Winnipeg police murdered three Indigenous people uh, in Winnipeg. Um, Aisha Hudson, <clears throat> a 16-year-old girl, Jason Collins, and Stuart Kevin Andrews. Um, so uh, there were there were multiple demonstrations outside of this building, um, and these are, this is a photograph of sort of people's signs taped to the building. <clears throat> um, 
Okay, so just up the block now, um, <clears throat> this is, <laughs> how am I doing for time? Um, sorry, I'm having trouble seeing the clock here. Just a second. You're just at five after the hour, Owen. Okay, thanks. Um, so the <laughs> this sign for condos here was a was a scam. These condos never happened. Um, center rent. So these are and so like I I'm not that interested in in corruption, uh, sort of sensational stories of corruption. Other than the they show the sort of the shady world like that this that the state gets involved in when they try to gentrify the city um and so like rather than providing housing for people um they get involved with you know with real estate firms that are basically just trying to get as much money out of out of the state as they can so anyway <clears throat> um this this firm from southern ontario was going to be given this land um they took they took deposits. They were going to get six and a half million dollars from the city too, which which thankfully never actually flowed to them. In the end, they took deposits of about, um, I believe. Let me see here. For millions and millions of dollars, anyway, they took deposits on condos. This was going to be the tallest uh, building in Winnipeg. Um, they took the deposits. I don't know what ever happened to that money. I think that they probably absconded with it. They never built the condos um, and they pulled out of the project and Center Venture took the land back. Um, <clears throat> but this was, so this is just behind that parking lot and behind that sign. Um, this is the former site of the St. Regis Hotel where a lot of people from Main Street were pushed after, um, after all the demolitions on Main Street. Um, <clears throat> uh, and so, um, until 2017, the St. Regis Hotel contained 101 rooms, primarily housing Indigenous peoples visiting Winnipeg for healthcare. Um, the St. Regis Hotel bar is known as an historic gathering place of the two-spirit community in Winnipeg, um, according to um, Elder Albert McLeod, um, and especially during the 70s and 80s. Um, <clears throat> in 2012, Center Venture bought the St. Regis Hotel and immediately closed the bar. Um, in 2017, it evicted the hotel's residents um, and last year they demolished uh, the hotel. I'll get back to that slide. So <clears throat> this is what the hotel looked like in 2018 after they had evicted everyone and closed the bar. Um, and this is what uh, it looked like when they demolished it last year. Um, <clears throat> but this was one of the first um, things, uh, things that Center Venture did sort of as part of its new mandate in what it, what it called the Sports Hospitality and Entertainment District or shed for short. Um, and this is a, a tax increment financing area it required provincial, provincial approval to create. And it all centers around um, <clears throat> the, da the downtown hockey arena where the uh, owned by True North, um, which is partly owned by the richest person in Canada, uh, the Thompson family, David Thompson. Um, <clears throat> so it's all around, so it's sort of to, to spark quote unquote real estate investment, luxury real estate investment around the hockey arena. Um, and as I described earlier, it essentially means that, um, you know, millions and millions of dollars in grants are available to, to real estate investors in this area in lieu of um, property taxes. Um, <clears throat> um, and actually what happens is a lot of that, a lot of the money that um, developers would have paid in property taxes, um, including the provincial education tax to, to fund uh, the province's public education system instead goes directly to center venture and then center venture spends it on what it calls investment protection and investment protection is all about um, again identifying these hot spots of quote unquote untoward people people who are going to threaten the comfort of condo buyers and uh, people who go to hockey games um, and of course in in Winnipeg this is a racialized dynamic um, where most of uh, the latter are white and the former are, in, are indigenous. Um, <clears throat> so one of the first things uh, Center Venture did in partnership with the police was identify the St. Regis Hotel as one of these hotspots, buy it, uh, evict people, demolish it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, now um, there's a plan uh, to turn this into a mixed use uh, office retail, retail um, residential development that I don't have a lot of details on. Um, but anyway, in this interest of time, um, we're going to move to Portage Avenue. <clears throat> so we're, we're down here on Smith's, uh, 
Smith Street at, at the tower, at that public housing tower. Now we're going to <clears throat> Portage Avenue. Um, this was one of the first investments that Center Venture was aiming to protect by demolishing the St. Regis Hotel. Um, <clears throat> So this is a condo. You can sort of see the um, the balconies here of these condos, and then this is a sort of boutique hotel, alt hotel. Um, so this was built by the Chipman family, uh, who are the sort of primary owners of True North, um, in partnership with the Germain family of Quebec. Um, they received five million in public, five million dollars in public funding for the construction of these um, two towers. Um, <clears throat> and as you can see, uh, the this section of Portage Avenue is, um, you know, caters to low income people. There's lots of uh, uh, dollar stores here. Um, as we walk down Portage Avenue, we see a uh, payday lender, um, a sort of a job bank for unemployed people and, and another dollar store. Um, and Center Venture tr has tried to get all of these um, uh, storefronts out of there. Um, because they're, they're, you know, according to Center Venture, bad for the image of the area. Um, <clears throat> this is the hockey arena. Uh, this was built with $40 million of public money and is privately owned by True North. Um, <clears throat> so now we're going to go down uh, towards uh, True North Square. Um, this is a former movie theater, uh, um, the Metropolitan Theater. Um, that was gifted to Leo Letahowski, who's a local hotel owner, hotel chain owner, um, who also received $3 million to renovate it into sort of a banquet center. Um, another one of the ironies of this whole process is that there's, there's a lot of sort of moralizing talk about, we need to get uh, drunk people sort of out of the city. And of course, uh, that's like often an extremely racist trope. Um, <clears throat> um, but the irony is that uh, spaces are created for other people to to drink to excess, um, and, you know, not not limited to the hockey arena itself. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to pass the the Millennium Library, which is the large downtown public library in the city. Center Venture installed this sculpture to make it look um, fancier, I guess. Um, but more uh, more importantly. Um, <clears throat> in 2019, the city of Winnipeg administration in consultation with city police um, exclusively, they didn't consult with anybody else about this, uh, installed airport style security, uh, an airport style security checkpoint at the entrance to the library, which was unprecedented in Canada. Um, it led to a, an enormous drop in library attendance. Um, uh, and it generated fierce resistance um, by a new grassroots group called Millennium for All. Um, <clears throat> so activists cited the exclusion of Indigenous peoples, people of color, unhoused people, and the poor from one of the only truly public indoor spaces in the city um, and argued that <clears throat> support for people rather than exclusion would be the source of real safety um, at the library. Um, <clears throat> so this is a sit-in or a read-in um, that Millennium for All organized um, to sort of to open the library back up again. Um, and this has actually been successful um, during the pandemic. The city quietly removed the checkpoint um, and promised to create a, a new community resource space at the library. Um, so that's a small victory for the people of Winnipeg. Um, but <clears throat> we'll walk down uh, Graham Avenue and this is, uh, we'll see sort of one of the, one of the newest uh, uh, developments um, in Winnipeg in the Sports Hos Hospitality and Entertainment District, um, <clears throat> which is True North Square. So this is a luxury condo office and retail complex owned by the Chipman family, um, by the Richardson family, which is one of the long time uh, sort of um, millionaire families in, in Winnipeg and one of the richest families in Canada, um, as well as um, the Gagliardi family, which is a wealthy family, uh, Vancouver-based family, I believe. Um, <clears throat> uh, so th these are three of Canada's richest richest families own this development. Um, they received more than $20 million in public money. Um, they initially promised to make 10% uh, of the 200 housing units here uh, affordable, uh, affordable housing. 
Um, but uh, at, in 2018, they said that that wasn't going to be economically feasible for them, uh, uh, which the city um, sort of agreed to and let them keep the, the $20 million and not make any of this affordable housing. Um, <clears throat> the other notable thing about Trunar Square is that it's privately owned public space. So it's teeming with, you know, private police. Um, you can't really do anything here, uh, like out of the ordinary, including uh, smoking, smoking, like if you light a cigarette, you'll be asked to leave. Um, <clears throat> I was involved in a sort of like a street hockey game here as a as a protest as part of Budget for All. And that was quickly, you know, met with like about 10 security guards and they also called the cops. Um, so it's quite an interesting place. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the most interesting thing about it, in my opinion, is that um, this was, so this is right across the street from True North Square. Um, this is the former site of the Carlton Inn. Um, the Carlton Inn was very similar to the St. Regis Hotel. Um, it was a 108 room, uh, you know, low income hotel that again, predominantly housed um, First Nations people in town for healthcare reasons. Um, the Chipmans, Richardsons and Gagliardi's uh, demolished the Carlton Inn. They saw it as a, as a threat to True North Square. Um, <clears throat> um, so Center Venture bought it in 2012 um, and demolished it in 2014 uh, at the behest of those um, aforementioned families. Um, so True North is now building three towers on the, the former site of the Carlton Inn, an 18 story uh, luxury hotel, a 13 story uh, condo building, um, <clears throat> and a 19 story office building that will be the North American headquarters of Wawanisha Insurance, um, which is a, an insurance company with uh, over $9 billion in assets. Um, so uh, a, a, something I found out recently actually about this was that you can actually see out in the corner here that there there were um, <clears throat> uh, there were dorms here for Royal Royal Winnipeg Ballet students, and uh, True North demolished those, but promised to to rebuild them elsewhere nearby. Um, but they've never sort of acknowledged the loss of that housing at the Carlton uh, Inn, um, and have never promised to to replace it with anything. Um, so this is what the Carlton Inn used to look like. Um, this is Center Venture demolishing it. <clears throat> um, okay, how, how are we doing for time? It's 20 after. Okay, so uh, I wanna finish up in five, five minutes and leave time for questions. Are there any, any questions at this point? Nothing in the chat. I don't see anyone raising their hands. If you wanna come on audio for a minute, feel free. I'd say go ahead, Owen. Okay. Okay, so now <clears throat> we're gonna head north back back to Portage Avenue. Um, this is Portage Place Shopping Mall. So this is a sort of famous or infamous, um, depending on how you look at it, uh, downtown shopping mall in Winnipeg. This was a 1980s era urban renewal project. Um, <clears throat> the quick story behind this was that um, in the 1970s, uh, city council tried to build a freeway through an, an inner city neighborhood. The residents organized against it. The freeway was, was, the freeway was supposed to span this, the rail yards. Um, the community instead proposed that the rail yards be moved and that the money to be spent on the freeway would be spent on the basic needs of the community for housing, clinics, uh, community centers, women's centers, et cetera. Um, instead, um, the Lloyd Axworthy, the MP for the area, um, sort of co-opted that grassroots movement, um, got $100 million from the three levels of government for an urban renewal program that he said was um, in, in response to those demands and instead spent it on this shopping mall and, and a couple of other shopping malls in the city, as well as other things. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, it, it was, you know, this was aimed at suburbanites to attract suburban shoppers. It never worked. Um, it became, it has become a, you know, a local mall for local people. There's a lot of um, sort of cheaper retailers uh, here. It's the only place to get warm, affordable food in, in the city center, really, uh, at all times, at all times of day and, and all times of the week. 
um, <clears throat> a, uh, sort of one of Canada's most notorious uh, landlords was going was just recently going to buy it. Um, they got they got a commitment of fifty million dollars from the city and province um, to buy it and renovate it, and asked for fifty million dollars from the federal government as well as two hundred and forty million dollars in loans. The federal government um, didn't uh, agree to that, and so the Starlight um, dropped out. Um, but the future of the mall is very much um, sort of uh, un, in, undetermined at the moment. Um, so it's quite vacant. The, the pandemic has led to quite a few vacancies in the mall. Um, it's sort of, it's like a very, uh, it's something that Winnipeggers like to talk about a lot and um, the future of this mall. And there's a, there's a definite possibility for the community to get organized. I would say, <clears throat> you know, take hold of that fifty million dollars in in city and province provincial funding and turn it into a real um, community controlled space, ideally. Um, anyway, we're going to go into <clears throat> the Central Park neighborhood now, brief, very briefly, um, and and I and I include this in the tour just in terms of thinking about Central Park sort of as unfortunately a, a gentrification frontier, right, of the city. So um, <clears throat> we can see that a lot of the the you know energies of of developers and the state have been focused on gentrifying this this part of the city south of Portage Avenue, um, but really their their developments are moving uh, north or are, are encroaching on the Central Park neighborhood, um, <clears throat> and Central Park is is home to you know a lot of ind indigenous people, um, black people, and people of color, low income and working class people still who haven't been pushed out. Um, this is the Quest Hotel uh, and Medical Center that is like formalized infrastructure for people from Northern First Nations visiting the city for healthcare. Um, this is on Ellis Avenue, so which is the street just north of Portage Avenue there. Um, and this is the view from Ellis Avenue of the Glasshouse Condo and Alt Hotel Boutique, boutique Hotel buildings. Um, so it's really, um, you know, these sort of um, gentrifying developments are really encroaching on Ellis Avenue um, and the Central Park neighborhood. Um, Central Park is home to a lot of affordable housing, um, <clears throat> uh, a lot of both privately owned and um, uh, publicly owned affordable housing. I think I, this is the biggest concentration of public housing um, in the city. Um, there are multiple, this is all public housing that I'm showing now, these high rises. Um, it's also quite a beautiful park and neighborhood. Um, so unfortunately, you know, ripe for gentrification in some ways. Um, <clears throat> this school, uh, I also just wanted to touch on the sort of radical tradition or tradition of resistance in Central Park. Um, this school, Sister McNamara School, is named after the sort of grassroots leader of that rail relocation movement that I mentioned. Um, <clears throat> and Knox United Church uh, is home to multiple um, you know, community organizations, um, <clears throat> um, as well as uh, um, Knox United Church hosted uh, Angela Davis when she came to town um, a few years ago. Um, so it's quite a community-based um, and active and political place. Um, and I just wanted to end on that sort of hopeful note. Um, anyway, thanks for joining me on this quick tour of the city. And uh, yeah, I wanted to just uh, open it up to questions at this point. Sorry, I see am that. I, am I, did I stop sharing my screen? Does you I, did. Okay, great. And you have a couple of people who are raising their hands to ask a question. And I think Betty was first and then Serenity. I, I hope you, my screen isn't working too well, but so I hope you can see and hear me, but um, thanks. That was so interesting. I, I grew up in Winnipeg. So this is like just sort of very informative and deja vu. So thank you. Um, I was just wondering, I might've missed something about this at the beginning and in a way you came back around to it at the end, but I, I just wondered what, um, political activist sorts of movements there might be um, resisting this gentrification and and um, the the uh, oh, you, you use the name so many times and now I'm forgetting it center whatever it is 
but um and also what 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 political voice in Manitoba or in Winnipeg is is advocating for public housing if any thank you for that question Betty so it's 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 really interesting um you know because resistance to to various sort of uh, like gentrification projects in Winnipeg seems to be sporad very sporadic um resistance to the to the youth for Christ um building that we started the tour with um was like it was extremely uh fierce and well organized um same with you know resistance to the security checkpoint at the library um resistance to the sort of gentrification of, of Portage Place Mall has been um anyway there has there has been quite a bit of organizing although it hasn't really led anywhere um there isn't there isn't I would say like uh, concerted resistance to the overall plan of gentrifying Winnipeg City Centre or concerted resistance to Centre Venture itself um, that I'm aware of. I mean, I don't know everything about what's happening. Um, <clears throat> but um, in terms of public housing, I mean, so the interesting thing in terms of the, the sort of formal political landscape in Manitoba is that um, there was a new democratic party government from 1999 to 2016 um here and so that's most most of what we talked about we most of what i just talked about on the tour took place under an ndp government um center venture was created with the support of the ndp and the, the ndp you know was a public supporter of everything um virtually that uh, i just talked about um they're quite a uh, you know centrist um party here in Manitoba, uh, as uh, I hear they are elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> so, and of course they support um, public housing. Uh, the NDP supports public housing. Um, the Conservative Party has, like it was the Conservative Party that um, sold off that building on Smith Street, that public housing tower. Um, the NDP didn't, hasn't done any of that as far as I know, um, although I think, well, I, I don't know I don't know that much about the NDP's public housing policy, so I shouldn't say too much. But um, they have a publicly stated goal of building a lot of public housing, but uh, they, you know they haven't built any kind of meaningful amount that would make a dent in the the number of unhoused people in the city. I would say. Um, so uh, serenity. Yeah, thanks, Owen, for that talk. It's interesting. I wish we were in person so you could, you know, have a little flag and point us to all the things we should be looking at. Um, I just had a few things to um, ask and say to, I was just, the, especially that the youth center on Main Street, um, they're aesthetically, it's, it's so big and overwhelming and so shiny. And I love that you can tell that something is off, right? Anyone walk, driving up Main Street or walking up Main Street, you can tell something went off because it's, so big and shiny and everyone ignores it. And so I love this idea of how you can aesthetically, you can kind of see a kind of politics of ignoring or when a project has not been able to um, be, be um, um, embraced by the community. So I love that you can read cities in those ways. I was just wondering if in your tour, you also look at, um, it's right across, it's right down the street from that, uh, the U Center, um, the, it's a building where they used to have um, housing for Pullman porters. Have you heard of this history? Yeah, I was wondering if that's part of maybe part of your tour. And um, and then just the last question, I just wanted to know where what Center Venture is, like where are they located? Where is that money? Like what is what are they and what do they do? Do you have a list of names that you can share? Thanks, Serenity. Yeah, so uh, I haven't gone to the the old headquarters now. You, I um, I wish that I could come, that uh, that I could have the official name of the organization of <clears throat> the the sleeping car porters union in the city, and there were also uh, a sort of litany of other um, black organizations uh, in the early like the early part of the 20th century headquartered there. Just so if so, where we started the tour at Higgins and Maine, if we would just go under under the tracks through the underpass there and north on Main Street, we would come to that building um, that was sort of the hub of uh, of like black political life in the city at that time and and where the first uh, you know black labor union in I think people say North America um, mm -hmm. 
uh, was started. Um, so that would be, yeah, an amazing place. And I, and, you know, I think as that, so I'm familiar with that history prim primarily through um, Sage Matu's book, uh, North of the Color Line, which is um, out with UNC Press uh, about 10 years ago. Um, but I think as, like, I never heard about that as a student, for example, you know, uh, in, in uh, like a high school student or even a university student in Winnipeg. Um, but I think as Winnipegers, like, become more aware of that history, hopefully, like, that, yeah, that building will, will I mean, it's ha it has such historical significance. So I hope that, like, you know, people would be interested in preserving it for that reason. Because I think right now it's, like, for sale, actually. I think it's it's the kind of building that's for sale, like, every couple of years. And, and it did turn into a condo. <laughs> yeah, well, it's on the wrong side of the tracks for that. I mean, that's, yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, no, but thanks for that question. And then, so in terms of center venture, like, so it's an arm, it's, you know, quote unquote, arm's length um, entity, the city created it, but it's a private corporation, but it still has sort of like a legal relationship to the city in terms of it, it has to report to the city every year, um, making decisions about, a, you know, a certain threshold of uh, like m an amount of money they have to um, have city council permission, but the idea is that they're able to operate as a private firm, um, sort of making deals uh, without this without political interference. Um, <clears throat> so it really was created to to like make public decisions about land and buildings in the city center uh, secret, uh, private, um, <clears throat> and not allow for any kind of uh, democratic interference or interference from the residents of the area or anyone with a stake uh, in the area. Um, <clears throat> so, and you know, they've evolved, like they've been around for 20 years, which is a really long time for one of these sort of experimental, like, in sort of like governance, modes of governance. Um, uh, so they ch they've changed over the years with, and they've had different focuses and different CEOs, like their current focus is the old uh, <clears throat> police headquarters land now, um, which, we, which we didn't get into, um, but that's their sort of main thing um, these days. And I wish I could remember the CEO's name, but I can't, sorry. Um, so, okay, I see Michael's hand. Hi, well, thanks for your talk. I mean, it's, a, it's absolutely fascinating. I guess I, I just, I had done a question that was very similar to Betty's, so that was already answered, but while I was waiting, I was thinking of something else. And namely, the like when I think of gentrification, I think of kind of like the topographical erasure of identity, and it's replaced with a void. So, I mean, it's almost like the, the very existence of a place is destroyed when you raise all these buildings and then you replace it with something that's not kind of devoid of meaning, right? And what I guess what I'm curious about is where is Winnipeg holding strong in terms of the identity where they're resisting to a degree? Maybe there haven't been, like you said, enough unified movements to succeed against places like Center Venture or whatever. But where do you go to Winnipeg to see the real Winnipeg now that like these this entire neighborhood essentially is being transformed in a kind of very negative way. Yeah, yeah, and I mean that I was sort of I gesturing at that by and ending the tour in Central Park. Um, <clears throat> and you know, the North End is, as far as I know, uh, quite ungentrified. So north of the tracks, um, I'm sure there are pockets of gentrification. I mean, I know North North Point Douglas, like you have people who uh, 30 years ago might have bought a home in Wolseley. Now I'm just making local references of uh, a, a neighborhood that's been <laughs> gentrified for quite a long time. And now, now people are moving into the North End. So anyway, um, but yeah, there are, there are lots and there's plenty of places in Winnipeg that are not gentrified because it's a, it's such a slow a sort of growth city. Um, it's not, it's far from, you know, attract, attracting glo global investment, uh, you know, at that, at the scale of those other cities that I mentioned. Um, but I did want to, I thank you for that for that comment, Michael, because thinking about identity and thinking about what's lost and what's and what replaces what's lost, like I do I think about the 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 new developments as actually a source of a, a new kind of like white settler identity in the city. Um, <clears throat> so I'm in, you know, in my book, Stolen City, like I, I trace these these various development visions sort sort of from the late 19th century when <clears throat> when the government was trying to lure white, white settlers to homesteads to farm um, on the prairies, you know, 
up to the up to the present day when <clears throat> when the government is trying to lure white settlers to buy condos and go to hockey games uh, and buy expensive you know meals um, in the city center. Um, and it is, and it is this kind of, because it's, it's marketed as an, ex, as a lifestyle, right? Like it's marketed as something that's exciting. Uh, it's marketed as some, as a new kind of urban living for white people who, you know, are so often like conflated or used to the sub the suburbs, which have such a bad rap by now, like as being boring or, uh, <clears throat> not a place of any kind of meaningful life. Um, so white people want to live in cities, right? Like, I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm, sh I'm sure there's a whole l cultural gentrification literature that I should be citing when I say this, but like, that's how they sell it. Um, it's not really about settler, like white settlers, <clears throat> um, like accumulating capital on an individual condo buyer level. Like it's, or the whole thing is orchestrated by large real estate firms. Um, <clears throat> but the settlers are necessary for that because they're the ones buying the condos. And so they have to, and there's this whole, there's this whole new identity um, that's wrapped up in it. I think, I think it's a way of like saving whiteness from the suburbs in a way. Um, I see uh, Adina. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for the, for the presentation. I learned a lot and, you know, I'm a new Winnipeg beggar. So <laughs> I'm very much interested in, um, you know, in street art, which seems to be um, a trait of Winnipeg. So you can see all around downtown and different neighborhoods, all sorts of graffiti or, you know, tags on walls. I'm just wondering if you include that as a form of, you know, showing Winnipeg's identity to newcomers or to people that join you on your walks yeah absolutely yeah thanks for that question Adina I I have yeah it, I that was sort of one of my methods like when I was doing this the research for the book was to look at <clears throat> physical traces uh, and look at posters and, and graffiti um, sort of as a counterpoint um, you know because because um, this whole idea of like a, of a new urban lifestyle is also is advertised visually like at construction sites and in a, in billboard advertisements et cetera et cetera um, and so there's sort of a contest like between that there's a visual contest that you can read in the landscape between those advertisements and the sort of like the the marks that people leave on buildings and, and other places. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, often those are like anti-police sentiments. Um, but there's also, there are traces of like resistance to gentrification in, in graffiti and other sort of physical traces in the city. Um, so I definitely think that's a way that like people, the, you know, the people respond to the, to that kind of dominant narrative in the, that's in the landscape of the city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Serenity. I was just wondering if if there's other folks who want to ask something, I, I, I would make room. But I, I was just wondering if you have um, a grasp, Owen, of like how much, because it's true north, right? Like how much having, uh, how, how much professional sports plays in all of this? Um, that, you know, like does this time, from what I've seen in the city, all of this has kind of coincided with the Jets coming back to Winnipeg. Um, and I know that's a really common thing that happens in U.S. states now that stadiums are now being, um, they used to be in the suburbs and now they make them in cities and, and downtown urban cores. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, I don't know, the Jets or professional sports in general, their relationship to real estate, but also, um, yeah, how they promote these ideas of now downtown is safe for suburban suburbanites to come into the kind of cultural politics of that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, yeah, uh, the whole, like, the whole, sh the whole sports hospitality and entertainment district is because the, the Jets came back to Winnipeg in 2011, I want to say. Um, <clears throat> from, so True North, the Chipman family bought the, the Atlanta Thrashers hockey team, moved them back to Winnipeg um, and renamed them the Jets. And of course, culturally, Winnipeg is a hockey city. 
um, and tickets to NHL hockey games are extremely expensive. So those are mostly like affluent white people from the suburbs who uh, can afford that. And it's also a white sport. Um, <clears throat> so uh, um, yeah, it's all because of that. So what? So the thing, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm really com like commenting about professional sports, but like the thing that was interesting about that shed phase of center venture as compared to Main Street and Waterfront Drive was on Main Street and Waterfront Drive, there was no interest from, from real estate firms in that land. Like Center Venture, that's why Center Venture was created. Like it was all abandoned, there was no interest. Center Venture had to go out there and look for deals and offer people money and stuff. Um, this, this phase around the hockey arena was entirely the opposite. It was the Chipman family going to Center Venture and saying, look, we have this all in the works. And the other thing about it, I mean, that connects directly to professional sports is that um, like uh, the owners of the teams are now like, I think, and I'm sure this will be <clears throat> confirmed through case studies in other cities uh, across the world, but owners of professional sports teams, like it seems to me are real estate uh, like moguls for them, for the most part, like it's the real estate uh, around the, where the team plays that makes up a huge part of their their profits i would assume i haven't looked into that um, but just the scale of the investments and the scale like the scale of the investors involved is you know it's quite significant um so it's really like it's not it's no longer and i'm i'm not sure if this is a change or not but it's definitely not like we're going to buy this sports team and the sports team is going to make us a lot of money it's like we're going to buy this sports team and we're going to buy up the land around the arena and that's and it's the real estate development sort of spin offs that's going to make all the money and then the city uh, will pay for the stadium right that's the city will pay for the stadium the city will like get rid of the people who live around the stadium for us um like it's a lot of that it's like <clears throat> and it's like site in a crude way it's like site preparation which is the um like and that's a term that like center venture uses like they'll prepare the site for investment and they'll take on that cost and that's a subsidy itself to the investor right and and you know site site preparation in a racial capitalist society means the removal of of people of color <clears throat> uh often uh, and certainly in this case um but yeah, I'm sure there's like a million ways to unpack that, the whole hockey professional sports like thing that I'm not even aware of. Yeah. Um, I don't know how, oh, I see we have uh, three minutes left. To, um, I don't know if anyone else has a, a question. I see Roland. Oh, sorry. Uh, hi, Owen. Thank you for this very insightful presentation. Uh, I came here as an international student in 1999, and even then there was a lot of talk about the revitalization of downtown. So with all those people buying condos downtown, why is that not happening after 20 years still? Thanks for the question. Um, there was like, there's definitely an over uh, production of condos in Winnipeg city center because it was, it's so, it's been so heavily subsidized by the state um that uh yeah i mean i think that a lot of like anecdotally like that glass house condo building um <clears throat> on portage avenue is like mostly airbnbs now um short-term rentals um so i think that's a sign like i think when condos are converted to airbnbs perhaps that's a sign that the market isn't isn't very robust um although i don't know maybe it's just a different kind of market that's more profitable in some ways. Um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, this question of like you, you asked Roland, like, why isn't the revitalization of the city actually happening? Um, and of course, it's a subjective uh, word, like, and some people would say it certainly is, like is happening. And like, that's actually, I feel like been the, the sort of civic narrative is that it, the city is being revitalized. Um, and, and um the Jets, the NHL hockey returning to the city is like the number one sign of that. Um, but yeah, certainly like it's not, it's a fine line. I think there's not like people making money hand over fist in, in Winnipeg city center the way they are in other cities. 
Um, and I think that's why there's this, there's this like, especially intense racial anxiety, um, because it's not a sure thing that you're going to make money on real estate in Winnipeg. Like people are investors, nas national and international investors are quite skeptical of that idea. Um, so that's why Center Venture, you know, does everything they can to, to remove people and police people and make it a sort of sanitized, um, white controlled space that seems risk-free for investors. Thank you. I guess I can wrap up today's session for us to stay on time with the rest of the conference. Thank you so much, Owen, for virtually walking us through the city. Um, yeah, there's so much to learn for Winnipeggers about our own city. And thanks everyone for coming out today. Thanks so much, everyone. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks all.